أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا ونبينا وشفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين Dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma j'al ma naquluhu wa naf'aluhu khalisan li wajhika al-kareem. Before I speak about the last lesson, inshaAllah, in this series, because tomorrow we'll be taking a conclusion, I want to know something. Because I've met a few brothers who are from Germany. So I want to know who is from Germany in the audience or who speaks German. If you could raise your hand. One, two. Who else? Three. MashaAllah. Okay. Who's from Lebanon? Ahlan wa sahlan, ahlan. Who's from Pakistan? Do you have any Pakistanis? Ahlan wa sahlan. Okay. Khoja. Okay, I'm not going to ask about people from Iraq because obviously most of you are from Iraq. You're all welcome. Thank you for attending this majalis. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. The last lesson I want to speak about tonight is the lesson of enduring hardships. When we face a small hardship in our life, in our day, throughout the day, we lose balance. We, get, we lose track. We don't have a clear stream of thoughts anymore. Small and simple tasks become heavy tasks, big, big tasks because we face the hardship. Especially when you go to your mailbox and you see a brown envelope. I've been told brown envelopes are not welcome. Yeah, no one likes brown envelopes. So when we face a hardship, we lose track, we lose balance. But we don't have big responsibilities. What we care about is our ourselves basically and those who are we are responsible of our family so how about big personalities like the maraja big scholars because we worry about our own issues this is all we worry about my house myself what i want to do what i want to eat but we have these maraja and scholars that i fe i feel that we don't give them their right we just see them and know okay he's a scholar he's big he's known that's it. But no, they worry about the Islamic Ummah. And from here we see the greatness of the Imam. Because let me put it in, in other words. Before you get married, all you worry about is yourself. What do I want to eat? What do I want to do? Where do I want to go? And then once you get married, you have to split everything into two. What do we want to eat? Where do we want to go? What should we do? And then when you get your first child, it's split into three. Fourth child into four. Fifth and so on. So the bigger your family becomes, and I know some of you take care of their parents as well and relatives and other people, ma'ajurin inshallah, but you have a small circle of responsibilities. But when you're in a position where you lead people, like the maraja do, like the imam does, it gets harder, and you're selfless. The Imam, the Prophets, they were responsible for all of humanity. 
So they had no ego, basically, because they were responsible for each and every one. That's why when you read some sermons in Nahj al-Balagha, we understand Imam Ali السلام, a, way, a little bit better when we see him as he is responsible for all of humanity, all of mankind. However, this is us on a daily basis. We face small problems, we, we lose track, we don't know what to do anymore, but we have it in a smaller size, each and every one of us. But if we look at Sayyidah Zainab السلام, and her hardship started in, an early, in early years, we see the greatness of Zainab Because she lost her grandfather when she was four or five years old. And then shortly after, she lost her mother Fatima السلام, A few years later, she lost Ali ibn Abi Talib, Amir al-Mu'mineen, he was killed. And then she loses Al-Imam Al-Hasan السلام, and then she goes with Imam al Hussein to Karbala. Only to see how her family members get killed in front of her eyes. They set the tents on fire, they attack her, but still Sayyidah Zainab السلام, takes responsibility. She still knows how to act, what to do and what to say. And she was 55 years at that time. In Karbala, Sayyidah Zainab السلام, was 55. But she still knew what to do and how to act. And then we see Sayyidah Zainab السلام, in the night of the 11th of Muharram. After Ashura took place, we read that she prayed Salat al-Layl during that night. What does that mean? That should indicate something to us. Because there were three important prayers in Karbala. The first one is the prayer of Al Hurb and Yazid al Riyahi. When he cut off the road, Al Imam al Hussein, and prevented him from continuing to Karbala, to Kufa, it is said that he prayed Jama'ah with him. One of the scholars mentions that this might be the second reason, because I've mentioned the first reason in a previous lecture. This might be the second reason why Al Hurq the Tawfiq on the day of Ashura to change the side. And then we have the second prayer, which is Imam Hussein's prayer on the day of Ashura. When he prayed during the battle. And then we have the prayer of Sayyidah Zainab السلام, in the 11th of Muharram. After the long journey, the dry desert, the thirst, what she saw during the day, they attacked the tents, she, com she gave comfort to the kids. She protected Imam al-Sajjad but still she prayed Salat al-Layl. And you know Salat al-Layl is a recommended prayer. I'm sure some of us would have not even prayed any Salah at all if we faced what Sayyidah Zainab faced. So if she gives so much care and attention to a mustahab prayer, a recommended prayer, then we don't have any excuses to neglect our prayers. But what does that mean? Yani we can take a lesson from each prayer. We can learn from the prayer of Al-Hur that sometimes prayer can change your life. We learn from Imam al Hussein and his prayer that prayer has the highest priority. And we learn from Sayyidah Zainab السلام, that prayer is not only a, a physical activity, it's a spiritual approach, it's a refuge, it's a relief when you're exhausted. Elsewise, she wouldn't have prayed Salat al-Layl that night. This is how we see, this is how we have to see prayer and perceive prayer. This is what we should learn from Zainab alayhi salam. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And then the next day, she took responsibility when they left Karbala. And she was on her own. There was no one to help her and aid her. She was leading that caravan on that day. And if it wasn't for Zainab السلام, we wouldn't know anything about Karbala. But the greatest, the greatest hardship for the Ahl al-Bayt and for Zainab السلام, was it to be taken as captive. This is what Imam, Imam Sajjad says clearly when Abu Hamza 
Al-Thumali approaches him. The narration says that Abu Hamza Al-Thumali came to Imam Al-Sajjad and found him sad and gloomy. So he said to him, O son of the messenger of God, is it not time for your sadness to end and for your crying to lessen? And then he said, my master, being slain has become a habit of yours. And martyrdom is but God's honor bestowed upon you. Al-qatlu lakum aada wa karamatukum min Allah shahada That's what he told him. But what does Imam Sajjad alayhi salam reply? He says, before he replies, Abu Hamza continues. He tells him, wasn't your grandfather Ali ibn Abi Talib killed with the sword of Ibn Muljam? Wasn't your uncle Al-Hasan killed? So why are you still weeping? Then Imam Sajjad tells him, Shakar Allah sa'ayaka, O Abu Hamza. May Allah reward you for your efforts with the best of rewards, O Abu Hamza. And then he tells him, Did your eyes see or your ears hear that Alawiya was taken captive before the day of Ashura? He tells him, It's true. Al-Qatlu lana ada wa karamatuna min Allah shahada. Then he says, O oh, Abu Abd- oh, Aba Hamza, killing our men has become normal to us. Yes. But is having our women taken as captives normal? Do our tents usually get set on fire? By God, O oh, Aba Hamza, I do not look at my aunts and sisters without remembering how they fled on the day of Ashura from tent to tent. And the enemies were calling out, Burn down the tents of the oppressors. While the women sought refuge with one another. And they were calling out, O Grandfather, O Muhammad. This is the greatest hardship Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam faced. And still, she took responsibility and knew what she had to do. She didn't lose balance. And then after that, she had to enter the majlis of Yazid. And we spoke about the attributes of Yazid, and that he had no red lines, and that he didn't care about anything. Sayyidah Zainab salam has to enter. No one used to see Sayyidah Zainab salam, and now she has to enter to that majlis, and not only sit, yani it, would have, it would have been enough for her to just sit in that majlis, as a, as a bala and tribulation. But no, she had to speak. She held a speech, and had to face Yazid. And she did. And that's why they said about Sayyidah Zainab السلام, when she was speaking to Yazid, it is if it was Ali ibn Abi Talib speaking. Even though she had all these hardships that I, went, uh, that I mentioned in the beginning. Sayyidah Zainab السلام, should be a role model for us to look up to her during our hardships. And then, one of the scholars mentions a comparison between Zainab السلام, and Asya. He says, Asya, the wife of Fir'aun, when she faced what she faced, she asked God for death. The Quran tells us, وَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مْرَأَةَ فِرْعَوْنَ إِذْ قَالَتْ رَبِّ إِبْنِ لِي عَنْدَكَ بَيْتًا فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَنَجِّنِي مِنْ فِرْعَوْنَ وَعَمَلِهِ They said, وَنَجِّنِي مِنْ فِرْعَوْنَ وَعَمَلِهِ And save me from Pharaoh and his doings as I can't take it anymore. Please take me to you. And I don't think anyone has doubts that what Sayyidah Zainab went through was harder than what Asya went through. Yet Sayyidah Zainab never asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for death. When she was asked, how did you see God's deeds upon al Hussein? She said, Ma ra'aytu illa jameela. I did not see anything but beauty. And she said, Allahumma taqabbal minna hadha al-qurban. Oh Allah, accept from us this sacrifice. This is how Sayyidah Zainab salam behave. This is how Sayyidah Zainab salam during hardships took responsibility. And she knew how to act and what to do. She didn't lose track or balance. Even though she was a woman. Because some people think, in no sense, like women, are in, like don't have this capa- capacity like men, you know, but Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam, no, teaches us something different, something else. Tayyib. 
So now, how do we act when we face hardships? Because you know, each time and era has different hardships and difficulties. Each generation faces a different hardship. Because I mentioned before that we should learn from history and that history repeats itself. For example, we have a shirk. I want to get to a point, and I ask you for patience because I want to mention something very important in a little. For example, we have a shirk. We see that Luqman tells his son to not commit shirk. He, sa he says, وَإِذْ قَالَ لُقْمَانُ لِبْنِهِ وَهُوَ يَعِذُهُ يَا بُنَيَّ لَا تُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ إِنَّ الشِّرْكَ لَظُلْمٌ عَظِيمٌ Behold, Luqman said to his son by way of instruction, O my son, join not in worshipping others with Allah, for false worship is indeed the highest wrongdoing. Allah, in the past, they used to commit shirk when they were giving ibadah, doing ibadah to the idols and statues. This was their shirk back then. I don't have to convince any of you that this is wrong, that we don't have to do that, that this is wrong, to worship idols, to worship statues. I don't think I have to convince anyone about this fact. But we have shirk nowadays too, alhamdulillah. We're not free from shirk. But shirk has a different way of manifestation now. It, it's not in idols and statues. We have a different way and a different type of shirk. But back then, this was the mainstream thing. There was propaganda on doing ibadah to these idols and statues. That's why no one would have a different opinion. This was what was trending back then. No one would stand up and say anything against that, even though maybe they knew that this was wrong. But this is what society does. And for example, you know how we have people that think the earth is flat? I'm sure they existed a few hundred years ago too. But back then, no one would speak out. If anyone had a different way of thinking, they wouldn't stand up and speak about their different way of thinking. Because society wouldn't accept. No one would accept them. But nowadays, since we have social media and everything, they yet just go, you go on Twitter or anything else, put hashtag flat earth or whatsoever, and they find a community. They find people who they relate to, who are like-minded. So then they speak up. They come back in confidence and tell you, yes, I think the earth is flat. And I have people who think like me. I'm not alone. So they speak out. Back then, they wouldn't speak out because society wouldn't allow them to. They would be ashamed to speak out and say, I think the earth is flat. This is just an example. You have, you have your own examples, Yani, on what I'm trying to say. So people wouldn't speak out, but since they found a group of people who supports them, who is with them, who is next to them, they stay in confidence and say, yes, this is the way I think. You have your own way of thinking? Okay, but I have my own way of thinking because I find people who are like-minded on social media. I'm not alone with this. And this allows people to do things. And for example, let's say in our countries back then, a woman wouldn't take off the hijab because society wouldn't accept. But now, since social media is presenting us examples of people taking off their hijab, they take off their hijab because they find people who support them, who stand with them. So, however, back in the day, they used to practice shirk through worshipping statues. But now, we read the ayah and Luqman tells his son to not commit any type of shirk. Not only because it is not logic, but because it is injustice too. ظُلْمٌ عظيم. طيب. هلا, when we talk about shirk, I don't mean shirk in the belief that someone halla believes that there is a God next to God. This is shirk in the belief, if you commit this type of shirk, you're out of the religion, and so on. We're talking about the smaller form of shirk. The smaller form of shirk is shirk in the obedience. That you give someone else than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
the right of obedience, whereas it only belongs to Allah. No one else has the right of obedience except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you give anyone else the right of obedience, if you listen to anyone else but Allah, then you're giving them the right of obedience. Then you are committing shirk, a smaller type, a smaller form of shirk. So Luqman is advising his son to not commit any type of shirk. He's telling him, be the master of your own self. You have to be able, you should be able to choose whatever you want to do. Don't listen to anyone else than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because we see our freedom in obeying only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how we are going to be free. This is freedom to us. Because if we don't obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're going to obey someone else. And then we are servants of someone who is a servant himself. So that's why we only obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he is the only one who is worthy of having this right of obedience. That's why some scholars, when, when it comes to the verse, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا آمِنُوا O you who believe, believe. They say that the first believe is, O you who believe in Allah and his existence, believe in your actions. Believe as in obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِوُجُودِ اللَّهِ آمِنُوا بِطَاعَةِ اللَّهِ يعني أَطِيعُوا الله. Obey Allah. It's good to believe in the existence of Allah, but it's better to obey Allah. So that's why you need to be the master of your own self. This is what the Islam wants to give you. This is, this is what the Islam wants to do for you, to be in charge of your own nafs. That's why no one should get in the way, not your family, not your friends, not society, not any influencer, especially when it comes to social media. Because when we talk about social media, many think that social media is free. It is free. You don't have to pay money to use it. But you're paying your attention. And when you pay your attention, they sell you their products. But this is, we say in, in Lebanese, نص مصيبي. It's not that big of a deal if they sell you their products because you're giving them your attention. What's more dangerous is when they sell you their way of thinking. They sell you their lifestyle. They sell you their worldview. This is when it becomes dangerous. They influence you and then you get their way of thinking. And once you think like them, you act upon what they are telling you. And if they are delivering a message that is against the teachings of Allah, then you are committing the small type of shirk. If you listen to them, you're committing the small type of shirk. So we need to be careful who we listen to, who we follow. Because Imam al-Baqir says the following in one of his narrations. He says, مَنْ أَصْغَى إِلَى نَاطِقٍ فَقَدْ عَبَدَهُ فَإِنْ كَانَ النَّاطِقُ يُؤَدِّي عَنِ اللَّهِ فَقَدْ عَبَدَ اللَّهِ وَإِنْ كَانَ النَّاطِقُ يُؤَدِّي عَنِ الشَّيْطَانِ فَقَدْ عَبَدَ الشَّيْطَانِ He who listens to a speaker has worshipped him. Thus, if the speaker performs on behalf of God, the Almighty, then he has worshipped God. And if the speaker leads from Zatan, then he has worshipped Zatan. Because your actions are based on your thoughts. I'm sure most of you know this famous quote that says, Watch your thoughts. They become your words. And watch your words. They become your actions. And watch your actions. They become your habits. And watch your habits. They become your character. And watch your character. It becomes your destiny. It starts from the thought. So if you are following people on social media who are giving you ta'limat, teachings, that are not the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you are committing a small type of shirk. Because it will leave an impact on you. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.
Because you know what's dangerous about this? Once you accept their way of thinking and what they are trying to tell you, they occupy your mind and your hearts. And once they do that, you are willing to give them everything. In some countries that are occupied, we still see resistance. Why do we see resistance? Because they occupied the land, but they did not occupy the hearts and the minds. Once they occupy the hearts and the minds, they will give them their land with no war, with nothing. They will give them more than their land. So this is dangerous. If our hearts and minds are occupied and influenced by the teachings of Zatan, of Iblis, then we have to fear our destiny. Especially when somebody on social media has a lot of followers. We get fooled by that, deceived by that in our subconscious. Yani. Especially the youth. Because when they look at someone who has two million followers, they think, he, no, he can't be wrong since so many people are following him. So many people are liking his videos, his posts, his tags, his whatever he posts. So he can't be wrong. And this is something that is used in many fields. For example, they say in sitcoms, comedy shows, you know how you have sometimes comedy shows that play in recorded lotta? Like when, when something funny happens, they play in lotta. Okay, they say that um, they did a study and they found out that scenes that were played with that lotta in the background were rated funnier than ones who weren't. Because it gives you a signal that, you know, people laughed at the scene, so you should laugh too. Same thing happens with people who, who gather money on the street. They put money before they start their day because it gives you a signal that since people have put money in whatever he's gathering money with, then you should give money too. This is how it works. So same thing with, with influencers and known personalities on social media. You think that since they have so many followers, since so many people follow them and listen to them and comment on their posts and like them, that they must be right. But it's not always the case. So we should be aware who we follow and who we listen to. Because if we listen to the wrong people, then we are obeying them. We are committing a small form of shirk. I want to finish with a narration that speaks about this form of shirk and how hidden it is. Imam al-Sadiq says, الإشراك في الناس أخفى من دبيب النمل. Committing shirk among people is more hidden than a black ant. هلا somebody could say, no, it's okay, I can see a black ant easily. But the narration continues. الإشراك في الناس أخفى من دبيب النمل على المسح الأسود. Committing shirk among people is more hidden than a black ant on a black stone. So you won't recognize a black ant on a black stone easily. But the narration continues. الإشراك في الناس أخفى من دبيب النمل على المسح الأسود في الليلة المظلمة. Committing shirk among people is more hidden than a black ant on a black stone in the dark night. This is how hidden this type and this form of shirk is. That's why some scholars, when they would write books or do any good deeds, they wouldn't let anyone know about what they were doing because they didn't want to commit this small type of shirk that they, that they do it for someone else but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let me give a conclusion to what I spoke about Halla in this lecture because I spoke about different topics I felt so Basically, what I was trying to say is that we should look up to Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam. Because she went, what she went through, but she still took responsibility. She didn't lose track. She was still aware of her responsibility and fulfilled it in the best possible way. After all that she went through. And then I talked about that we face hardships. And that our hardships are not always like th those who were before us. Hardships repeat themselves. 
God's universal laws repeat themselves. History repeats itself, but in a different way. No one is worshipping statues now, I hope. But we should pay attention and be aware that we do not worship anyone but Allah because if we listen to someone else but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we are basically worshipping them. Allah is the only one who deserves the right of obedience. That's why we shouldn't commit any shirk in listening to someone else but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Muhammad. It's the night of Ali al Akbar. The narrations when they speak about Ali al Akbar and how he took permission from his father Al Hussein ibn Ali say that he went to Al Imam Al Hussein and he asked him if he could take permission to go to the battlefield. Imam al Hussein didn't tell him, yes, you can go to the battlefield. He hugged Ali al Akbar and he started crying. So Ali al Akbar knew that this was his permission, that Imam al Hussein had allowed him to go on the battlefield. When Ali al Akbar went on the battlefield, he said, Ana Ali ibn al Hussein ibn Ali, Nahnu wa baytillahi awla bin Nabi. He went and he fought. And Layla, his mother, was standing next to Imam al Hussein and she was looking at the face of Imam al Hussein. As long as his face expressions were normal, she was at rest that Ali al Akbar is okay. But then the face expressions of Imam al Hussein changed. So she asked him, Oh Abba Abdullah, did something happen to Ali al Akbar? He said, No but somebody came on the battlefield and I fear that he might kill Ali al-Akbar. She said, what can I do? Tell me something that I can do for Ali al-Akbar. He said, go and pray for Ali al-Akbar. For the prayer of the mother is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She then went inside her tent and said, O oh, you who returned Yusuf to Yaqub, O you who returned Musa to his mother, please return Ali al-Akbar to me. And then Ali al-Akbar killed the one who joined the battlefield and he came back to his father. But he was tired and thirsty, so he told him, al qatalani. Imam al-Hussein told him, go back on the battlefield. In a little you will meet your grandfather, Rasulullah, and he will give you a cup of water. He then went on the battlefield and he fought until the enemy surrounded him and they started hitting Ali al-Akbar from every angle and every side. Until he then fell on the ground and called out, Abba ya Hussein, adrikni, please come look after me. So Imam al-Hussein went to Ali al-Akbar and he stood by his head and then he saw Ali al-Akbar smiling and then he was crying. He told him, oh son Ali, why were you smiling and then crying? He told him, because just now I saw the Prophet sallallahu and he gave me a cup of water. He told him, okay, but why were you crying? He told him, because I saw my grandmother Fatima. And she's looking down upon you and calling out, wa Husayna, wa Mazluma. <laughs> Imam al Hussein then wanted to take Ali al Akbar to the tent, but he couldn't do this by his own self, so he called the companions to take Ali al Akbar to the tents. When he returned, Sayyidah Zainab came to Imam al Hussein and asked him, What happened? What happened to Ali al Akbar? Imam al Hussein looked at her and told her, Ali rah, Ali rah. <laughs> 